So, welcome everybody, Shabbat Shalom, and uh, tonight we are focusing on discussing the feast called Purim, or Purim. Now, I don't know if you guys heard about Purim, it's basically the story that's in the book of Esther. Now, what's interesting about the name Esther, it means hidden. So, first of all, the name yod hey vav hey or Yahweh, is never mentioned once in the book of Esther. But if you look underneath the surface, throughout counting different letters and different verses, the name yod hey vav hey is revealed four times. So not only that, the hiddenness within the book of Purim has a prophetic foreshadow or picture of what we can expect and it specifically focuses on the idea of preparation because Esther had to prepare herself to come into the presence of the king so that was a year process for her to approach the king so if we look at the spiritual significance of that it means that we need to go through a purification process that will take longer than just washing your hair in the morning and putting on some perfume, and there I go, I'm ready to meet the king. No, it's a long process, and it had two aspects to it. It had a six-month period of purification, and then another six-month period of purification. So we're going to focus on those two six-month periods to see what we can learn from that and what we can apply to our lives. Because prophetically, we sit within the time frame prior to meeting the king. And she was the bride of the king, and as the bride of Messiah, uh, prophetically, we need to prepare before we can approach the king. So that's something that's never taught in a church, in a modern-day church. 
because we're okay. We're saved by the blood. We can be raptured tomorrow and we'll be fine. But that's not what the patterns in Scripture teach us. There's a lot of patterns and things that we need to understand. One of, the, one of my friends at work asked me to explain the concept of salvation. And there's a short version, but there's the actual version that involves a bit more to it. So salvation or preparing for this event called salvation is basically similar to what we're going to discuss with Esther, preparing to meet the king. The second thing I want to focus on is the concept of the decree. Now there was a decree made by the king through the influence of Haman and they decided or he persuaded the king that the Jews needed to be annihilated on a certain day. And that devastated Mordechai. He went into sackcloth and ashes. He was crying out and through Esther and her approaching the king, she could get the king to um, give a second decree. Now, what we could note here is the principle of the king's word. Now, when a king speaks, it is like the law of the land. And it's normally the words of a king that is written down that become the law of the land. So, when a king speaks a word, not even the king can override it. He needs to speak a second decree in order to add grace because of the first decree. Now, if we compare the decrees to the Old Testament, if you like, it's actually just the Tanakh, and what we know is the New Testament, or the, 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 the books pertaining to explaining the work of Messiah through his death and his blood and his redemption, we can see that whatever led up to the book of Matthew is called the first decree. It had all the history of, of humanity, sin, the fall of man, and then the prophecies about the future restoration and redemption of man. And then when Yeshua came, he came to fulfill exactly that, and through his work, now we have the ability to access that second decree. Now, what the church teach today, which is not accurate, is that the second decree annul the first decree, or the New Testament overrides the Old Testament, and that's not true. And that we see in the book of Esther, because the second decree only added grace. The decree that the king made the second time around, he gave permission for the Jews to have weapons, and they could defend themselves. So they had to train to prepare in order to defend themselves, because that day of annihilation was still in the calendar, waiting for them to be uh, uh, annihilated. So with us, when sin came into the world, the death penalty, which he gave to, to, to Adam and Eve, he said, this day you will die. Now that day they died spiritually, but humanity went into a lower state. Now I've got this picture, I'm not going to talk about the picture now. A lower state, and that lower state had death embedded in it. So we are now in a state where we will potentially die because there is a time called judgment, just like the time when the Jews will, will be annihilated, that we will have to face. We all have to face death. But there's a second decree spoken or written through the work of Messiah. We now have the opportunity to cross over that. Now last week when I did the a study on Ibri, I discussed the concept of crossing over. Now this is exactly where we need that concept of crossing over because we will cross over that barrier called death so that we can enter into the promised land which has the evidence of eternal life. So that is basically the two aspects that I'm going to focus on. Uh, first of all, Esther and the purification, and secondly, the annihilation of the Jews. And I asked myself the question, who do the Jews represent? So through a little rapid trail, I came across things, and then we, it exploded in a beautiful picture that linked back to, to Genesis. So we're going to look at that. So in saying that, um, the book of Esther, is, or the Feast of Purim, is one of the festivals 
that is right in between Sukkot and Passover. So I've got a menorah pattern here. Let me just take that out, otherwise you don't know what it is. So there's Purim. So after Sukkot, it connects Sukkot and Passover. And in Hebrew thought, time is cyclical or there's cycles. So Purim is actually the connection between those two. And we're going to look at why I say that. I'm not taking Hanukkah out of the equation because you can remember what we discussed on Hanukkah. Hanukkah was a delayed Shavuot. Ach, trumpets. Ach, I can't remember. No, it was a delayed Sukkot. That's right. You win the prize. <laughs> now I'm confused with Shavuot Sukkot. Yeah, Hanukkah is a Sukkot, uh, Shavuot, uh, Sukkot, that was celebrated late because the temple wasn't ready yet. So it's nothing new, it's just a Sukkot festival. So that's why Hanukkah doesn't appear here, but only Purim. So we're going to see the connection between that. And in the invite, if you notice behind the text, it started off with bread, then there was a bit of unleavened bread, and then there's fruit. So it's a transition from bread to fruit. Because Sukkot is a, a fruit harvest, and Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits associates with bread. So we're going to look at the transition from bread to fruit linked into Purim. And Purim is that link. How we can move from being bread eaters to people eating fruit. So that's the whole concept. So, the cleansing of Esther. Now that's found in Esther chapter 2 verse 12 where she underwent a process of six months of purification which included oil and myrrh and then there was a six month purification of sweet odors. Now we're going to look at those um, elements in a moment but before I do that, I want to look at the three words, six month and purification, and what that represents. Because those are the things we need to engage with in order to prepare for the coming of the king. So number six is the word shesh. Those who speak Afrikaans, we, we say ses. So that comes from Hebrew shesh. Um, it's shin shin, with a little dot there. Stefan, on the right hand side to make the sh sound. And shes comes from the word sus, which has got a vav in the middle. Now immediately those who have um, been to the Hebrew letter studies, where we did the aleph and the bed, we also looked at the letter vav. Now the letter vav represents man, it's also number six. And the letter shin means fire. So this is a little picture of a man in trouble amongst the flames or someone within a furnace. Now if you can picture yourself as silver that needs to be purified, you need to be put inside of a furnace for the impurities to surface and then it can be scraped off. So that's the idea of the six month purification. It's the purification of fire. There's another medium that you can wash yourself with, and that's water. That's more gentle than fire, but it's not as potent. So you get more done with the fire, more purification done. So that's why she had to undergo this extreme purification that has, uh, is associated with, with fire. Now, sis means to shine like a light, and it also means joy. So the outcome of this purification process, which is very painful sometimes, is joy, and you will be shining like light. So the, the concept of shining is also linked to holiness, because your holiness is something that you walk, you walk holy, because He is holy, and when you walk holy, you actually mean that your walk is set apart, it looks different to the people in the world, and therefore you stand out, you're like a light shining. So this light is associated with holiness. And the end result of this process brings joy. So this is actually the goal. What Yahweh wants us to achieve. 
What is the reason for my purification? He wants me to be holy, and he wants me to experience his ultimate joy. But for the ultimate joy to be in my life, I need to be purified from all the things that bring sadness and death and confusion, all those things associated with the fallen state. The next word is month. That's Chodesh. Now those who understand the, the calendar, there's a cycle in the month called Rosh Chodesh. That's the head of the month. Now Chodesh actually means new moon, but it also means month. Now a month, when you hear the word month, or Chodesh, it immediately links to the festivals. Because all the festivals are synced into the year, but through the cycles of the moon or the Chodesh. So they are driven by that. So the month is synonym or equal to the festivals symbolizing that. That's why I've got the festivals as a backdrop to symbolize the purification process of the two six month periods. Now as you notice through the festivals for those who are not familiar with the festivals, there are seven festivals and they are actually just a summary of the work of the Messiah. So these are the things that the Messiah came to do for us. Now the first three festivals are called spring festivals. It's Passover, Unleavened Bread and First Fruits. They have been fulfilled during the first coming of the Messiah. So we can have the benefit of that first six month process that is associated with those three festivals and apply it to our lives. We can access that. Now what, what do we get as a result of these three? We get the fourth one because they lead up to the fourth one and as I explained previously the menorah, the middle branch is the most important branch. That's the one where everything hangs off or that is the focus point or the reason why the others exist, they make sure that the outcome is this one. So in saying that, those three things that had to happen, which the Messiah did for us, led to the fourth one or the outcome or the benefit of the fourth. So Shavuot, as we all know, is where we receive the commandments and also the outpouring of the Spirit. So what do we get as a result of that? We get the Word and the Spirit. And the symbolism in Hebrew for the word is the letter Mem. That also means water. That's one medium you cleanse yourself with. And then the next one is the spirit, which is the letter Shin, which we saw in Shesh and Sus. And the Shin represents the consuming fire con uh, attribute of Yahweh, and that is His holiness. So the function of the Shin, which is the role of His spirit, is to make us holy through the anointing. So that is the other six month process associated with that. So we get the two attributes or uh, means that will give us the benefit of the purification through the washing of the water of the word and the purification of his spirit making us holy as with the consuming fire putting us in a furnace. So that is the word month. Now the word Chodesh comes from the word Chadash, that means new, renewed, and repair. So that is the plan. So Chodesh is associated with the moon, but it's also linked to new, to renew, and to repair. So when man sinned, the whole of creation was cursed and now need to be renewed or repaired from a fallen state into a perfect state again. So this is the process that needs to take place or summarizing the work of the Messiah because he is going to do that work in us and in his creation. Now the concepts that is linked to, the con to, to these words is the new covenant or the second decree. So you see that associated with Chodesh or the month which is associated with the festivals. And the repair um, through creation um, is the other thing that needs to have a, uh, happen that will result into a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem. That will uh, be the result. And uh, the next thing that will happen is that we will be renewed in ourselves. So we are in a fallen state as well. 
and we need to be elevated within ourselves to be like Adam was before sin came. So there's those three aspects that will work within us. And all of that is seen with Chodesh. Now, purifications is the word Maruk, Memresh, Vav, Kuf. And that means to rub and to scrub. Now, if you've got a pot that's burned, you need to really rub it to get rid of that burning on the inside of the pot. So it's a, it's a heavy effort to get rid of those deep stains, those deep scars. So that's to do with the emotional side of man, where you have to dig deep inside of man in order to repair and to heal that and to cleanse you from that. Now, Maruk comes from the word Marak, that means to polish, to rinse till it's bright, to sharpen and to furnish. So the outcome of applying this purification process will be that you will be polished and shine bright and that is linked to your state of holiness. So that's the outcome. The other one is to sharpen. Now the thing to sharpen is a sword and that is associated with the word of Yahweh that is in our mouth that we can use against the enemy and this knife or, or sword needs to be sharp in order to be effective. So part of this purification is to give you the tool to defend yourself. And this is exactly what the Jews received. There was, they could have weapons to defend themselves. And the next one is to furnish. Now to furnish is linked to a house or a household. And a household in New Testament terms is the body of Messiah. So that is to make you part of a family or representing the collective body of Messiah. So you can't be on your own. The purification is there to unify you with like-minded people. So those three aspects is the outcome of the purification process. And it, just to recap, so Shesh is personal, it's your holiness, and it will result in joy. Chodesh has to do with the festivals and the moon, and it's everything that has to do with the outcome based on the work of Messiah, which is you're going to be a new creature is going to recreate his, his creation, which is new heaven, new earth, and he renewed his covenant or gave a second decree to help us to access that, those benefits. And the last one has to do with the collective body. And all of that is what the purification process is like. And that links up with the concept of the bride, which consists of a group of people that represent the bride, who will be married to the groom or to the Messiah one day. So all of these link up perfectly. So now we can see that the book of Esther, or the story of Esther, is exactly in, in sync with Yahweh's plan, and it also incorporates the festivals. So Purim represents our journey throughout the applying of the festivals. Now the festivals are yearly. Now some like normally teenagers, they think when they hear something for the first time or once, they don't want to hear it again because I already know it. I don't have to do it again. But in a Hebrew mind, you have to go over things over and over again. It's like going into a washing machine and, and you have to spin and rinse and to be cleansed with applying those festivals to your life. So the festivals are part of your purification process. And every festival has a different topic that will be applied to your life. And when you partake in these festivals, you will be cleansed within that theme of that festival. And there are seven themes or seven areas in your life that you need to be cleansed within. Um, so that is why the purification process and observing his festivals are one and the same thing. So if you say the festivals are nailed to the cross, you might as well take your washing machine, put it in the front of the yard, let them pick it up, and you can wear your dirty clothes. And don't worry about it. God still loves you even if you stink, even if you've got dirty clothes. But wouldn't it be great if this bride can actually have a beautiful white dress that is clean and not smelly? So it's all about preparing to appear before the king. It's not you being comfortable and staying feral in a fallen state. 
It's about you acknowledging that the king is higher than you and out of respect, I will do everything I can not to offend him with my smell or my look or my appearance. I'm going to do the, my best to look my best in order to stand before him and, and specifically as his bride. It will be very embarrassing if me as a groom prepared and there comes Letty with her little rags on and she's just done the dishes and the hair is laying there. Oh, I'm here. I'm at least I'm here. I'll, I'll, I'll get married to you. That will be a bit embarrassing, I think. But she's better than that. <laughs> she won't ever embarrass me. All right. So that is the first three words that's associated with the purification of Esther and how they link to the festival, specifically how Purim now connects this cycle that you go through. So even if you skip Purim, there's something missing there. There's some purification that's not going to happen. And there's a crucial part of your understanding of Scripture and the concept of a kingdom and a king that you will miss. And you will still be having a wrong mindset and approach and understanding of his Scripture and not being cleansed accordingly. So the next thing we want to look at is the three things that were used to purify throughout the two six-month period. So the first six-month period was done through oil and myrrh. So I've got those two there. Now oil is the word shemen, which is shen mem nun. Now I made that specific color so you can pick it up immediately. I can link the blue mem with the blue mem over there. And I can link the red shin and the red shin over there. And that represents the word and spirit that's associated with Shavuot. And Shavuot was the pinnacle branch, the most important festival, because I get that to apply to my life. Messiah did that so I can get that and apply it to my life. So it's not passive. You need to actively get involved with His Word through His Spirit. It's called personal relationship with Yahweh. And that is within the holy place. If you're going to the tabernacle... I shouldn't draw a picture. No, I won't draw a picture. If you go into the tabernacle, there's an outer court, and then there's a holy place and a holy of holies. Now, inside the holy place, there's a menorah, showbread, and a golden altar. Those three objects represent your personal relationship. The menorah represents the shin, or the fire that gives the light inside of the holy place, and the showbread represents the word or the mem. So you see those two are actually also linked to the holy place that leads to the holy of holies and the golden altar is your prayers or your communication with Yahweh that makes your relationship alive or two-way communication line between you and Him. So first of all the oil is the word Shemen and it's got the two ingredients that I received because of the work of Messiah for Him dying on the cross I now have His Word and His Spirit, and that gives me the ability to have the Nun. Now this is a Nun Sufit, so it looks like a big vav. it's got a long tail. A normal Nun just looks like a little bracket, but then it's on the front or in the middle of a word. So Nun means fruitfulness. What? Yeah. What's happening? Yeah, it's life. Sorry. So the nun represent fruitfulness. And the fruitfulness that's linked to the spirit is called fruit of the spirit. And that's a concept that we learned in the New Testament. So this is where it comes from. Because of the work of Messiah, I can now carry the fruit of the spirit in my life. It's not my fruit, it's his fruit that I allow in my life. And that will give me a beautiful sweet smell or sweet odor that will be part of me. Um, shemen means to shine and it also means anointing and olive oil. So this is the oil that is used to anoint a priest or a king. So it's something that is earmarked for someone important to elevate them to a, a seat of authority. And it's also associated with anointing. Now, anointing 
if you look at the Hebrew word, it's what the word Masiach means. It means anointed one. So if we are anointed, we are little Masiachs or part of his body representing him. So if we collectively come together, we represent the full Masiach or the full anointed one by little ones being anointed, unified together in his body. So this is basically um, supporting the idea of the household and the body that we saw with the word of purification because it has to do with the anointing the fruit of the spirit and the fruit of the spirit doesn't mean anything unless you can share your fruit if the fruit just hang on the tree and the birds eat it or drop and then it turns bad it doesn't mean anything so this is another concept um, that we found in the garden of eden adam and eve could, could eat from all the other trees so the question is was the other trees other people with the fruit of the Spirit? Mm. It can be. So within the body of Messiah, that's definitely the case. We are like trees and we carry fruit of the Spirit and others can come and eat from that fruit. And each of us is a different kind of tree and we have different fruits and we all need different kind of fruits to get all the sustenance that is collectively in all of the fruit together. Just like you need all your vitamins, you need all your fruit to survive. The next one is myrrh. Now myrrh comes from the word mor, memresh, that comes from the word marar, and both words means bitter. But the word marar has got two letters that's the same, and that's the letter resh. In previous studies we discovered that the letter resh rep represents head, it can also represent a leader, and we've got two kinds of leaders there. We've got one resh that's close to the mem or the word, and another resh that's to the left or in the physical. And the result is bitterness. So we've got two leaders that lead you into bitterness or bitter experiences or trials, tests, and tribulations. So who are those two leaders? The first leader is Yahweh through Yeshua. He allows certain tests to come across your path that will strengthen you, build your character, and will change you by squeezing you a bit, stretching you a bit, so that can be more room for Him. So we need to be stretched by Him. So those are the tests, trials, and tribulation that is not of the enemy. It is our loving Father who allow us to go to the gym, to exercise a bit, pick up some weights that you never picked up before and your muscles get sore because you're now exercising muscles that you might need in the future. So it's all about preparation. The other one is the enemy through temptation and the enemy can only come in if you have something that will allow him in your life. So if you are fleshly or you do this little pet sin or that thing, you will give him an opportunity to come and tempt you. And if you fall into temptation, then you will experience the bitterness of the consequences of the things that you allowed in your life. And you gave um, the enemy a right in your life. And you will suffer the consequences, which is also a bitter experience. But both of those build your character. And both of those are evident in all of uh, our lives. And we need to go through that in order to have this beautiful fragrance. Now, if, I don't know if you know that myrrh doesn't smell like anything unless you crush it. You have to crush it in order for it to release its smell. So that's why you need to be crushed through tests and trials like Job was tested, Yahweh allowed it, and also when you're fleshly, you allow the enemy. And then you will give up this fragrance. But when will you give up this fragrance? If you turn to the right, access the word, and utilize the word within that situation. A good example of Yeshua being tempted by the enemy, he said, it is written. He defeated the enemy. So he's got his little sword polished. Where was that? I missed that now. That one. You sharpen your, your sword. So that is your sword that you can use against the enemy. To defeat him and that's part of your purification process so if you are a believer 
there's a false message out there that you will always be blessed. The enemy will never come close to you. Everything in your life will from now on be perfect. You won't have any problems, any financial issues. Your whole life is just perfect. And most of all, you're a child of the king. You are now extremely wealthy. And you can receive all that money if you claim it and frame it and repeat it every day ten times in front of the mirror. Then the money will manifest in your life. Now that is linked to the teaching or DVD out there that's called The Secret. That's what they do as New Ages to try and manifest or manipulate the spiritual to manifest in the physical. And it actually works. That's why it's a deception. But it's not the way Yahweh planned it. So we shouldn't engage into that. Unfortunately, that teaching crept into the modern church and now they call it whatever they call it. It is applying the same bad technique. In, yeah, the word says, if you do his commandments, you'll be blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed going in, blessed going out, blessed will be your bowl, your fruit of your body, your offspring and all of that. He didn't say, repeat these words, claim it and frame it, keep on claiming and frame it, and then you will be blessed in the city, blessed in the field. No, it's linked to the commandments. So if you want to access the blessings, you do his commandments, and then the blessings will be released. The storehouses will be opened if you do his commandments. All right, so that is a bit of off track there. The last one is sweet odors. That's the word beshem. It sounds like besem in Afrikaans. <laughs> it also purifies. Um, beshem is bet. Shin Mem. Now again, I've color-coded it to make the link. Shin is the spirit. Mem looks slightly different because it's at the end. It's a little closed Mem now. But it's still the same Mem as that Mem. And it means word. Or the water of the word. And Beshem means sweet smell and spices. And the Bet in front means house. So it's a sweet smell within the house of Yahweh. And we have the two objects that is linked to um, the objects in the holy place. So I've got the menorah there. But this spices, when you go to scripture, it describes the verse where they actually use the spices to create incense. Now the incense is used to um, put in the oil that is used for light. It's also used to offer on the golden altar which create the beautiful sweet fragrance or the offering inside the holy place. So the sweet odors is that personal relationship that happened in the house or the holy place. That is your intimate relationship. And that is what we need to arrive at as part of our purification is that mature relationship, personal relationship with the Father inside the holy place. Now, the golden altar is the object that is closest to the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant represents the throne of the Father. So that's the object that's the closest to the Father. So a personal relationship with Him um, is related to Beshem, sweet odors, and your prayers, the Word and the Spirit in your inner room where you study, where you learn, and where you ask Him questions and where you pray and get strength from him through his spirit. So that is basically concluding the purification process that's associated with Esther, which are the beautiful gems inside of scripture that teach us what we are um, supposed to do to access. So the main thing that we learn from this, it's both of them. It's the word and the spirit. I know there's a tendency in the modern day church only to lean towards the spirit because there's power and miracles and feelings and all sorts of things there but you need the foundation of the word not to be causing wildfire because wildfire is a spiritual idea or the spirit let loose and that can engage other spirits as well which is not the spirit so we need the foundation of the word to discern the right spirit from the wrong spirit and not allow the wrong Holy Spirit in your life. So we've covered that in previous teachings. Um, so I just want to emphasize that. I just want to move over 
Now we're going to go to the annihilation of the Jews. The next concept. So how did I came across this picture? The annihilation of the Jews is in Esther 3 verse 6 where Haman sought to destroy the Jews. And I asked the question, who do the Jews represent? Yes, it's the Jewish people, but I think it's bigger than that. Because Esther represents the bride, so the Jews must represent someone bigger than an entity called the Jews, which is only one tribe. So Jew is the word Yehuda. I can write this on the board now. Or oh, actually Yahudi. It's Yod, Hey, Dalet, Vav, Yod, Yahudi. And Yahudi is a descendant of Judah, and Judah is the word Yahuda. Now, Yahuda is the same as, let me write it here, Yod. Hey, Vav, Hey, and inside Yote Vav, hey, sorry, not there. So Yahuda is Yote Vav, hey, with a Dalit inserted. So why is there a Dalit? This is related to Dalit. Dalet means door. And a door is an opening that leads to the next level or give you access to the room next door. Or it can lead to a way. So Yeshua is the door and the way that leads to the Father. Yeshua is the one that was born from the tribe of Yehuda. That's why the Dalit is found within that tribe's name. And that's just something interesting that connects to the Messiah Yeshua. Now, Yehuda comes from the word Yada. Take away the, the Vav. Comes from the word Yada. And Yada means to throw a stone or an arrow. It also means to revere, to worship, to praise, to give thanks, or to shoot an arrow, or to hold out a hand. So the concept of Yada is associated with worship and that inner room experience. So now we see that the Yahudi or Jews is pulling us back into the tabernacle, into the place called the holy place, into a place of intimacy of worship where we access through a door to come into the holy place and that's basically describing the entering of the, 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 the holy place and the, and the tabernacle now one meaning here that is evident is the holding out of the hand or the reaching out to something beyond the last week we looked at the word yada was it yada it wasn't yada <laughs> It was Ibri that comes from the word Abar. And Abar means regions beyond. So this time it seems like you are reaching out with your hand towards regions beyond. So there's something beyond a door or something out there that I want to reach. And it's that longing and reaching that give me the premise or the experience of worship because that is why I worship. Because I want to be out there I'm reaching out towards something beyond me and that's basically why we worship Yahweh that is greater than us that is beyond us and the concept of or being Hebrew links up with that idea now uh, Yada comes from the word Yad Yod Dalet now Yad means same as yod, that means hand. That's how you spell yod. And it's an open hand that reaches out. Now the word yod is first found in scripture in Genesis 3.22. 
And this is where the little rabbit trail started. <laughs> so what does Genesis 3.22 says? He says, after, it, the context is after they ate from the tree of knowledge, of good and evil. Elohim said, man is become as one of us to know good and evil, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Now we can see what the hand is reaching out. It's reaching out towards the tree of life, which contains eternal life, because I am standing in a place which is fallen that is linked to eternal death. So I'm reaching out to a state that is high and beyond myself, that is linked to a tree. So I drew the little picture. So now we have Eden, the perfect state, and we have two trees. Now the pink fruit are the fruit of the tree of life. And the tree of knowledge has got two kinds of fruit. So we've got knowledge of evil and knowledge of good. Blue is good, it's associated with truth, there's nothing wrong with it. But there's evil that gives you an idea of all the fallenness and all the bad things about this world and things that can tempt you. So man chose, there's Adam, he chose to eat from that tree. So he had this mixed fruit experience. Now we know that mixing is also the concept of Babylon. And eating from that tree opened up Pandora's box. And he now was consumed into the system called Babylon. Now inside the tree is not only the poison that killed him, but also the revelation of what's going to happen to him. So the knowledge and all the prophecies and the prophecies about the work of Messiah and everything that God's going to do to restore the world, everything was captured and contained within that tree. If man hadn't eaten from that tree, they didn't need the knowledge about the Torah, as per se, about prophecy, why I need to do these things, about the work of Messiah, why I need to experience and access the work of Messiah, because you will still be there, you don't need to be restored it's the people in this state that need that knowledge to reach out to something beyond them, which is the tree of life. We sit in another realm, a higher realm, a perfect realm beyond us. And through the knowledge of good, which is there is a God, He is beyond us, He's good, He's a loving Father, and He wants you to come to Him. That's that knowledge there. But then there's a, the, 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 the evil is, ah, oh, you need to be successful. Look at your neighbor's car. You need one like that. All the things that tempt us is also on the other hand. And now we're tempted. So now we've got the two opposing forces that cause um, that cis experience. <laughs> the temptation, or the, sorry, the, the, the mer, marar, the two reshes. We get the one leader that say, no, you need to good do, do good, the one on the one shoulder, and then the little black thingy on the other shoulder says, no, you need to do that. So we have that experience because we engage into this experience by eating from that tree, unfortunately. So we all fell to a lower state, the fallen state that is linked to death, because those mixing of fruit is not that tree. So you can't access eternal life by having that tree. So that tree was a test, or it's actually there to produce a choice. Because if Yahweh want man to love him, man must have um, a free will. And to have free will, you need to have two choices, which is good and bad, in order to exercise your free will. So if he didn't give us free will and choice, we cannot love. So to make us like him, he's a loving God, we have to have, have choice in order to exercise free will so that we can choose to love him. And to love him is to do his commandments. What did man do? They disobey the first commandment by not, not uh, avoiding that tree. So that is why we fell and we're currently in this state. But overlaying the story of Esther with this story of the Garden of Eden and the fallen state, we see that there's good news in that fruit and it tells us we can go through a purification process. That's two six-month periods. In this contains 
the work of Messiah, which is depicted by the festivals. And if you engage in that, you'll recognize the Messiah. And if you follow him, you can access his covering and his word and his spirit. And that will give you the access to reach out to eternal life, which is a tree that exists within our fallen state, which is the letter tough that represents the death that we don't have to experience so we can reach out to eternal life beyond this realm, but it's on the other side of this date that is set for the Jews to be annihilated. So we all have to cross over this death trap, but we need the information and the processes that is contained in the fruit of knowledge of good, which is Yahweh's Torah, to have access to the information that will help us to cross over and be covered in order to reach out with our hand and access the tree of life on the other side and in the process be renewed, be restored and all the things we saw with the purification of Esther. So this is all encapsulating the whole story of Esther. So we are currently here, we are accessing the purification processes which are within his word. And that's why we try to encourage other people who say they love Yahweh or Jesus to embrace the fullness of his scripture because we need all the purification processes in order to be perfect as a bride in order to stand before the king one day. We don't want to be not allowed into the room. We don't want to, to, be, to be standing outside the door and say, you're a foolish servant, go, go outside like he said to the five foolish virgins. We need to have the oil in our lamps and be ready. And this is one of the items that we saw that Esther had to have part of a purification process. So if we cross over, which is Ibri, Abar, which is actually what it means to be Hebrew. So I can with confidence say you have to become a Hebrew in order to be saved. That's your title now. Your Mr. or Mrs. Hebrew, you, that's your ticket to, to come in. Because the word Ibri and Abar contains all of that as well as we saw last week. And we also will engage with those processes as confirmed with the book of Esther as well. So in the fallen state, we now have access to be elevated and restored back to the restored Garden of Eden state, which is called the Promised Land, which have a new Jerusalem, a new heaven, new earth, and that is the house or the letter bed that we looked at previously, which is the household of the king who crossed over the Nile, who were covered completely and not being affected by judgment or death whatsoever. And then we will access the tree of life or eternal life. Now one thing I want to say about eternal life. Eternal life exists in the garden. Eternal life does not exist outside of the garden. And with that I'm saying if you take the tree of life, you take it outside of the garden of Eden, it will no longer be the tree of life. The tree of life can only exist within the garden. So that brings me to the next rabbit trail that I went through. What do we need to do to enter the garden? We need to be transformed into trees. Now I've got a whole technical explanation on that. You can So we're now going to look at this part of the, the equation or the board to see how we are transformed in becoming trees and what are we called currently and what's the problem with that. So that comes with the story of Haman who wanted to annihilate and eventually he prepared a place where he wanted to hang uh, Mordechai and he was hanged from that same um, place. Now the word hanged, oh, let me just get the board back for the people. I forgot. <laughs> Before I go there, let me go here. Yeah. So Haman wanted to hang Mordechai and Haman ended up being hanged. Now hang is the word tala which is tet lamet hay, but if you look in the Hebrew, 
It's got an Aleph Taf connected to that word Tala, which is not translated. So who's actually hanged? The Aleph Taf is hanged. Who's the Aleph Taf? It's Messiah Yeshua who was hanged. Where was he hanged? He was hanged on a tree. Because the word Tala is first found in Scripture in Genesis 40 verse 19. Let's talk about a baker that was hanged on a tree. So now we see that there's the one that's hanged is identified as a baker is hanged on a tree. So what does a baker make? What's the result of being a baker? Or what is the fruit of a baker? Is <laughs> bread. So there we get the new little rabbit trail. So a baker is the word afar, which is aleph pei hay, and it just means baker or to cook. Bread is the word lechem, and that is what he produced. Now lechem comes from the word lacham, which is also lamet mem, that means to fight, to prevail, and to overcome. So we see that the thing that the baker produces is associated with what the solution is to the problem the Jews faced. They are going to be annihilated, but they've got the option to have weapons and they can fight and overcome their enemies in order to live. So that is the solution to their problem is found within the object that they make as someone in a fallen state. So if we go back to this little picker, picture, that's called a baker. That's called a tree. He used to be a tree, and then he fell and he became a baker. And the correlation between a baker and a tree is, they both produce something. But from a fallen state, you produce something equivalent to bread. If you're in an elevated, unfallen state, you are like a tree producing fruit. When we looked at Psalm 1, it talks about that we are like a tree planted by stream of living water. And we bear fruit. And that's the concept of becoming a tree. Now, I need to make something with an effort. If I'm a tree, I'm just a tree and the fruit comes naturally. I don't have to push it or force it. It just happens. So there's no effort in being a tree. Now, if I want to jump back forward to the New Testament, what I said earlier, if you have the fruit of the Spirit, it's not your fruit, it's the fruit of His Spirit that you allow to hang on your life. It's not an effort because it's not your fruit. You don't have to fake it. You just have to allow it and be it. So that is showing us in a New Testament concept by like applying the spirit that we now receive through this event because of that I can now have the ability to be transformed from being a baker fighting and overcoming and prevailing against the enemy constantly or just being a tree to stand there and bear fruit without an effort so there's nothing from my part that I have to force in order to overcome the enemy. It's already given. It's not my battle, it's his. And we see that in a beautiful picture. So bread is associated with fighting and all that, death and the tree of knowledge. On the other side we have Eden. Now, the fallen state is related to earth or the physical. Eden is the spiritual state or the restored state that we want to be returned to. So, what we find in the in the Garden of Eden are trees. Now I previously said, were the other trees in the garden people that Adam and Eve could eat from? Because what I'm going to tell you now, you cannot enter the kingdom as a baker. You need to be a tree to access the garden. So you need to be transformed to a spiritual entity which is equivalent to a tree in order to be in the garden. And if you are in the garden, as I said, it's the garden that allows you to live forever. So your transformation gives you access and being there gives you eternal life. And that's 
equivalent to eating from that tree of life. Because you are also now a tree of life, or a tree that lives forever, bearing fruit. Now, if you look at the word tree, it's the word et. Now, it's iron tarik. Now, I drew it creatively so you can see it looks like a little tree. The iron is like a branch hanging off the tarik. The tarik looked like a righteous man you know, lifting up his hands, praying. Iron means I, but it's on the right hand side, so it means spiritual sight. And that gives you insight into the spiritual things because you, your eyes have been opened. Now I can see. What do I see? I see his word better because the flame of his fire is enlightening or shining his light on, on the words. Now I can understand them. So that's why we need to be a tree. Now fruit is the word peri, peiresh, yod. That comes from the word para, that means fruitful and to bear fruit. And that's exactly what I said. If you compare these two, this one has a lot of effort in it. There's some danger. You can be afraid because of that. Um, but this one is just bearing fruit and fruitful. There's no enemy. There's no threat. There's no nothing. Because your environment is a safe environment because it's equivalent to the Garden of Eden. And that's also what we looked at last time when we looked at Shamar, which is observe. You want me to draw you a little picture for those who haven't seen it? Let me just get it here for the people online's sake. Now this is what the Garden of Eden looks like in Hebrew. This is a thorny bush. You can't recognize it. And this thorny bush is guarded by the shepherd, which is the letter Resh. I need my blue. And inside this thorny bush is uh, the letter Mem. And then I've got the Shin. And this is the word Shamar. That means observe. What do I observe? His commandments, his festivals, his moedim, all the things in his word I observe. And it also means thorny bush. Now, the theme of Shamar is when a shepherd, after the day, they went to the pastures, they fed themselves, and now he needs to gather his sheep and put them in a safe place. He takes some thorny bushes and he builds this little hedge and he sleeps in front of the opening and inside is the safe place of protection. So on the outside there's wolves and enemies and all of that. On the inside it's safe. So if you are behind the shepherd, inside the thorny bush, observing his commandments and his festivals, you are protected. Now where do I find the information about his festivals? I find it in his mem, in his word, and through revelation of his spirit, and his spirit also is the shin, which is fire that leads to my holiness, which is also the information found in his word. So I need to be on this side of the shepherd in order to experience his protection. But you do get the radical Christians who sleep on that side of the Messiah. They know the shepherd, they, they look him in the eye every night, they stare at him. But they are exposed because the enemy is out here and they are not protected. And then Christians ask, why do I get attacked? Why does this happen to me? Why do that happen to me? Because you are not guarded and protected by him. So this is also a beautiful picture of the Garden of Eden. And what to allow you in is Shavuot, word spirit, and that's the pinnacle of all the festivals. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 
Okay, what we go through is this rash. Because we're protected, our fathers still allow us to be tested. But they get that one a bit more because they're out there. They're more exposed to this rash. And they get that one as well, so they get twice as much of challenges. Because they need more purification to happen in their lives. So we can't escape it because it's part of holiness to be purified. As you saw with that, you're in, uh, in between the flames or the uh, work of Yahweh's Spirit in you that purify you. But they also have the temptations of the things they allow in their life because they think it's okay. And they play with fire sometimes doing that. Right, so where were we? All right. Eternal life, tree of life, garden of Eden, and the concept of bearing fruit. Now, the baker. The baker has the solution to the problem. How do I transform from a baker into a tree? Now, in Hebrew, we normally see the, the, the answer within the problem. So being in a fallen state, I consist or have access to a hay, to a pay, and to an olive. And I live in the physical, so I access them from left to right. So the first thing I need in my life is the letter hay. The letter hay means light, truth, revelation. If I don't get the revelation and don't allow the revelation or the word revealed to me, in my life, I cannot be transformed. That's the first step. What's the next step? After I receive the revelation, I need to convert it into a pay. What is a pay? It means mouth or words. I now need to speak life into my situation or speak to the enemy it is written in order to be transformed. And the last one is the Aleph. Now the Aleph is an interesting letter because the Aleph represents yod heh vav through the number 26, if you add up the letters, with that being a Vav, which is six, and those are two Yods, being 10 each. So that is the Father, and we know that His Spirit adopts us, and we are now sons and daughters, and we cry, Abba, Father. So how can I become something or part of a family, uh, family if I'm not part of that family through their blood or their essence? So in a sense, I need the DNA of the Father embedded in me to change my nature. And you literally need a DNA change to change from a baker into a tree. And you can probably do it scientifically if you want. Um, so the Aleph represents that part of the father that is his DNA. Now, what made me think about that is there's two kinds of scriptures that describe the spirit of Yahweh. The one says he is from the father. The other one says it's the spirit that is from the son. So... If the spirit is from the sun and you give something that is not from you, then you are above that. So if the spirit is someone that Yeshua said, I will give you, it means that he's got authority of the spirit because he now commands the spirit to go. But it also said the spirit is from the father. So where does the concept of this idea of the spirit comes from? It means that the father actually gives of himself of his core being that is his spirit and the son gives of himself which is from his core being that is of his spirit the spirit that comes from the father is his DNA that changes your nature the spirit that is from the son is the spirit that purifies you that helps you which is doing the work of the Messiah but personally inside of you so they both give of themselves in order to transform you from a baker into a tree so you won't have to make bread but you can bear fruit effort effortlessly 
So that's a, a bit of a radical statement, but it's backed up by Scripture in the New Testament. You can study it yourself. There's passages that alludes to that the Spirit is the Spirit of Yeshua. And there's other passages that alludes to the Spirit is the Spirit of the Father. So whose Spirit is it now? So, and is there now two Spirits, or is it one Spirit that they share? All I can say is it's a spiritual concept that we don't understand. But the application, we can get an idea of why we need that. Because that's a function or powerful thing that needs to happen within me to resurrect my inner man so I can be transformed into this tree, so I can be planted back into the garden where I fell from. And it's the only way I can become a tree is to get his DNA to transform me and to engage in the processes which comes from the sun, which is the word. So I need both in my life. The DNA of everything, that's the Hebrew language. So if you study the word, specifically in Hebrew, it will change you. Just like I said last week, Hebrew is not only a language, it's not only a culture, it's a process, it's a place, and it's something that changes your thinking. And changing your thinking is start changing your being. And it's cha now changing your DNA, and you are now being transformed. But it's through the power of His Spirit that you're being transformed. And then the washing of the water of the Word is another aspect. So there's two components to being changed. The one is external, which comes from the Word, applying the Word with the help of the Spirit, which is to do with the Mem. And the other part is the anointing, because the anointing gives you an ability that wasn't yours before. The anointing gives you fruit that's not yours, and the anointing adopts you to being a son or a daughter of the Father. So the shin basically then represents what comes from the father to make you part of his household. And the mem is what comes from the son. And Yeshua is the living word. He is the way, the truth that leads to the father. Collectively, they are one. So you can't actually separate them, but you can separate their roles. And that's why I say the spirit is a role. And you can't separate the spirit from them either. But you can separate the role of the spirit. So that's just to try and explain a spiritual concept um, with the help of, of the Hebrew. So just to sum it up, the story of Esther is a story of purification. It's a message to the bride for her to prepare. And we saw the processes that she needs to go through in order to prepare. The reasons she needs to go through that is because we have both fruits fruit in our hand to get rid of that and access the tree of life and be transformed. So the first three festivals give us access to this one, which is the Word and the Spirit. But now we can ask, well, what are the other festivals for? Surely we don't get anything because we have everything now to meet the King. Only through them receiving that. So what does Yom Teru and Yom Kippur represent? They represent this time which is that time, the judgment. Because Yom Teruah is to do with trumpets, and there are seven trumpets. There are trumpet judgments. So that gives the time sink and cycles that you will go through through the three and a half years of tribulation. And Yom Kippur is the day of judgment, the physical day of Yahweh, or the day of annihilation. And that bracket is what we call the Great Tribulation, or judgment, or the River Jordan, symbolized. Now on the other side, if you cross over this period, you will access Sukkot. What is Sukkot? It's the feast of the fruit harvest. Now we're all trees. We're now in the garden. It is over and the new Jerusalem will come down and he will come and Sukkot with us. He will tabernacle with us. And that is the new Jerusalem and that is the final outcome or the last 
goal of all of that. So all we need is that to receive that in order to prepare for that so we can enter that. So that's the festivals summed up in the context and overlaid with the story of Esther. And that's why I believe the book of Esther is still scripture. It's still valuable for us to study because it's got a prophetic message to the bride that exists today. So that is all I want to share to you. So thank you very much. Purim starts Wednesday night. So for those who haven't heard it, because you're not on the microphone, Purim is a journey from Passover to Sukkot. And it's a cycle, as we saw here, and it's a yearly cycle because it's a purification cycle. And everything will not be purified this year. That's why I need to go through another cycle, and another one, and another one. It's an endless cycle until the day you die. Or until the time Yeshua comes. That we need to engage in. And Purim is next week, the 27th. The actual date. So we decided to do the study prior to that date. We do acknowledge the date as well. Because it's a historical event. But we want you to understand why you celebrate it. So it's not just about putting up the mask and having a party. Yeah, that's, that's probably okay if you do that. But you missed the point. There's an underlining message for the body of Messiah today within the time frame that we live in that we have to understand. We cannot water down the message of his Moedim trying to make it enjoyable for us. We need to make it educational for us so we can prepare. The time for playing games and all that is over. It's time to prepare. It's time to purify ourselves and be ready for the King is coming. So that is the true message of Purim. Yes. Yeah. I don't know, but I definitely say it. We we can. I will. I will spend time with as we go through the next cycle of festivals. So Passover will start soon, March, April, sometime. I will send through the dates. I will make a point of focusing on the purification within each festival as a theme connected to the festivals as well so we can understand um, the cycles related to tonight's study so what I said previously what we learned tonight is a foundation for what's coming tomorrow so everything that we learned is now foundational and we will see the world and the word through different eyes and Yahweh wants to build on this foundation so we will definitely build on what has been revealed so we can get the full access to what all the other festivals also mean from now on. Um, for next week, we're going to continue with the letter Gimel. So we've done the I'll have to bet, and now we're going to do the Gimel. So I'm very excited about that. And that actually links to the work of the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of content around that, and it's also a very interesting study. So I hope to see you next week. So I'll send out an email where it's going to be. Uh, most probably it will be here. Yeah. But I will let you know if there's any changes. So thank you very much for being here tonight. And may you have a blessed Purim. I will just close in prayer. And then Dina will dance for us. Thank you, Father, for your word and your truth. Thank you for having the freedom to study it. And thank you for your spirit that helped us to prepare. And thank you for your word. That's our foundation that we can apply to our lives. So we can prepare for you coming, our mighty, awesome King. We just give you the glory and the honor and the praises. Help us, help us to go through all the testing that you take us through. Because we know that you not, do not tempt us, but you do test us. And through every challenge that there is, you will give the outcome. Because the mem is there 
Your word is there as the outcome. Help us to stand against temptations that will allow the, the enemy in our lives and help us to purify ourselves, to take holiness seriously because it's all about you. In the mighty name of Yeshua Messiah. Amen. So Dina is going to do a, a dance for us and then we will conclude. Thank you very much. Tina and the girls, yes.